Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I, I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to today's talk. Um, today's talk will be uh, by um, Mindy Schwartz uh, and Stephen Server. Uh, we'll be working with Mindy. Um, it will be, as you know, the final talk in the series of 28 talks that, that have been held between October of 2021 and today on the topic that Mindy Schwartz helped develop. The topic was called the history of medicine and ethics. Um, there, there has been a, a yearly lecture series that started in 1981 and currently is in its 41st annual year of running this annual lecture series. Um, the series is jointly sponsored uh, both by the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics uh, and by the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. Uh, each year, uh, really since the early 80s, we've been presenting somewhere between 20 and 30 lectures. Um, in the past 10 years, uh, some of the lecture series topics um, have been uh, reproductive ethics, organ transplantation, pediatric ethics, global health, healthcare disparities, end of life care, neuroethics, the doctor patient relationship, and a few years ago, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but today I, I, I'm so excited to introduce you um, to, to the speakers. Uh, Dr. Mindy Schwartz is a professor of medicine in the general internal medicine department here at the University of Chicago. Um, Mindy Schwartz teaches nutrition courses to medical students and residents. And another area of her academic interest is the history of medicine. Um, Dr. Schwartz currently serves as one of the medical school advisors, uh, serving along with Brian Callender as the head of the Kagashal Society. She also serves as the chapter advisor for the Gold Humanism Honor Society. And she was former associate program director and chair of the internship selection committee in the Department of Medicine here from 1994 to 2004. Mindy Schwartz has been an award-winning teacher and was elected in 2010 as a master of the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Medicine Academy of Distinguished Medical Educators. Over the past 10 years, Mindy has studied and taught medical history to medical students and to internal medicine residents. In May of 2014, uh, Dr. Schwartz was the local uh, chair for the National Organization of Medical Historians called the American Association for the History of Medicine. Joining Dr. Mindy Schwartz today is MD PhD candidate, Stephen Server. Uh, Stephen is a member of the Committee on the Conceptual and Historical Studies of Science, the Department of History, and the Pritzker School of Medicine. Uh, Stephen recently submitted his dissertation entitled, A Test of Conscience, Navigating Mexico's Cervicio Medico Social, 1935 to 1940. The title of Dr. Schwartz and Steve's talk today is Studying the Past and Creating the Future. I'm delighted to turn you over to Mindy Schwartz and Stephen Server. Mindy, please. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, let me just make sure I'm, I am not muted and no, I'm not. Let me get my slides set up and I want to just share the screen over here. Here. And let's just do this. Okay, can everybody see the slides? Looks great. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Okay, so I wanted to thank everybody for coming today and for participating in this terrific educational experience. 
Um, as you know, this is the last lecture of the year, and I took a page as the um, organizer's prerogative to give the summary and closure because my friend and colleague Brian Callender did the same thing last year, and I thought it would be nice to have the last word rather than the first word. Now, when I first approached Mark about incorporating history into the interdisciplinary um, lecture series, I thought it would be a nice variation since it hadn't been addressed directly over the last 40 years. And I also thought that the historical approach would be very welcome, particularly in light of the shadow of COVID with a political situation, racial issues, climate change, congressional gridlock, and now an evolving war in the Ukraine. And if there was never, if there was ever a propitious time to study history, certainly now. And at the beginning, when we invited the speakers, I was actually hoping eventually that it would be hybrid, that we would go um, in person at some point. But just like everything else related to COVID, um, you know, you really, you, you can't bank on anything. So it turned out to be virtual and surprisingly, it, we've actually grown accustomed to it. You know, it will be nice to be in person, but I think a lot of us have anxiety about groups. So I want to go back to what I call first principles and make the case for the value of history in medical education, as well as clinical practice. And I hope doing this, instead of having given this talk on the first day, my hope is that I want to leave you with food for thought and hope to um, continue your interest in this area. For the ethics, fellow, I, ethics fellows, I've put together a bunch of resources that I hope people will be able to look at and share, including books and articles and other references. But on the last uh, slide, my goal is to give our um, both Steve and my email address. So anybody who's interested, I want to make this widely available. Okay. So um, as many of you know, um, anybody who knows me in person knows for the last 20 years, I've been reading, studying, exploring, sharing, and teaching medical history to anyone who will listen. Now, this is primarily the greater University of Chicago community. And um, personally, I've been interested in what I call clinical historical connections or the clinical relevance of the past in the digital age. Um, the other thing, the other piece of this talk we're going to give is called um, studying the past, creating the future, because at the best, I think history can give us a template of how to think about change when it comes along and how we can be maybe proactive rather than reactive. Now, Steve's going to talk about this as an activist versus a nostalgic view. But as we've learned, change is disruptive, and that means it's not linear. So maybe when the time comes for us to improvise, if we have a perspective about what works and maybe equally what has not worked, it will give us some um, insight into how to plan a better future. So history can teach us not only how to be humble, but maybe how to be active. And as the, the more we know, maybe the better we can get. And as Pasteur is quipped, chance favors the prepared mind. And maybe the issue is not so much as understanding the past as it is for advocating for the future. Now, this slide shows um, one of my favorite cartoons. When I was younger, there was a, a cartoon called Rocky and Bowinkle. And this is Sherman and Mr. Peabody. Now, Mr. Peabody's the dog, Sherman's the boy. And they used to go on these adventures in what they call the Wayback Machine. Now, the thing about Rocky and Bowinkle was they got the adventures wrong. But on the other hand, the thing about these adventures were that history was like an exciting place to go. And I always held on to that from when I was very young. And you can't study history without winding up back in ancient Greece, you know, one way or another. And this is Cleo, or Clio, the muse of history. And her name means to either make famous or to celebrate. And she's often shown with a stack of books, an open scroll, a set of tablets. And one of the several muses, origin of the museum, is um, Cleo. And Cleo is the daughter of Zeus and the titaness uh, Mnemosthene, who is the goddess of memory. So why study history? Why study history? It goes all the way back. And there's much written about why study history, but I'm going to go over some of the basic um, foundational issues that I think apply to history in general, and then I'm going to bring them more specifically into clinical medicine. Okay, And this is taken from the University of Wisconsin History website, which I thought um, 
made a succinct um, argument. So obviously we know the past is the foundation for the present. It helps us understand why things work or don't work. History also creates empathy as we understand, you know, in a more personal way that the people in the past were just like us, you know, imperfect, not omniscient, you know, making mistakes, fundamentally human. The other thing is history can be personal and very personal, you know. Um, all you have to do is watch um, that show, Finding Our Roots, and you can see how these very famous people who get exposed to learning about their history can be very, um, either sometimes really uh, encouraged or sometimes overwhelmed at their past. And then everything has a history. As I was looking at the website, you know, there's a history of, you know, history of refrigeration, history of condoms, everything that we know and are interested in has a history. But one of the important things about doing history is there's a skill set to history and history can be like a puzzle and historians are among the best detectives and historians are great researchers and that's part of the skill set of the historian. And I love this picture. This is a picture of Osler performing a history in physical. And one of the important points as a clinician is history is an, is an essential part of what we do every day all the time. The ability to take a history, every single patient we see, we have to take a history. And one of the critiques is that, you know, um, that we uh, cut and paste from the medical record, or as, as they say in computers, garbage in, garbage out. But I want to just show you and have you take a look at this picture for a minute. So at the top, it has a picture of Osler talking. Just to the top right, you have him auscultating. The bottom left, you have him palpating. And the thing that's just so powerful is he's sitting there with his foot on the chair, and he's actually thinking. And just as a, a moment of reflection in the modern time, that's the problem that we have with modern medicine. We're going so fast, you don't often get the time to think, but history and physical, you know, every physician is a historian at some way. So there are, there are two big, as well, let me say it differently. In my studies, I've been on a hunt to find materials that can introduce clinicians to history and um, speak to those who practice in a busy clinical world. And there are two really good references that help, uh, there's many references, but I'm going to cite two that give us a framework. And this is a article called Making the Case for History in Medical Education. And those of you who are attentive and paying attention will realize every single author on this, um, uh, this what we call, I call the white paper, have spoken in this lecture series. So you're really getting to hear from the best. And the next is a list of how incorporating aspects, understanding different aspects of, you know, clinical practice can really make a difference in clinical education. So things like disease, what we count as efficacy, medical knowledge, technology, physicians, medical institutions, and the medical marketplace, bodies, medicine and public health, and then health inequities and ethics. All of these things have a direct impact on medical practice and medical education and are all areas that are explored extensively by historians. Now, people often ask me, what's a good book to read about history? And I have many, many books, but if you want to read one single book, okay, this is a book by a guy named John Burnham. It's really written at the level of basically a college student, but the reason I like it is it helps organize a framework that we can build around. And it, he, he describes the book with five dramas, the healer, the patient, the disease, then we have discovery and transmission of knowledge, and that's a big part of the U of C ethos, right? And then medicine and health interacting with society. So I'm going to take that, you know, um, his framework and kind of explode it so we can learn a little more. And at the core is, uh, many people have talked about this, Jackie Duffin's spoken about this many times in her books, talking about the Hippocratic triad with the patient, the physician, and the disease. And it's easy to think about how these interactions are um, seminal to our practice and how many iterations we can find. 
And if you start with disease as a conceptual framework, you could teach history and medicine doing nothing but just speaking about disease. What's normal versus abnormal? The clinical experience of signs versus symptoms. Symptoms, what patients feel, signs of what we, um, we uh, observe. And then you have nosology, which is the branch of medical science dealing with the classification with, of disease. And this is clearly, you know, changed over time. We live in a world of medicalization, and I'm gonna articulate that in a minute, but the topic of demedicalization is equally important. What things were once the domain of doctors and now are actually considered normal? The whole ICD-11 codes, the International um, Disease Classification, which there's 55,000 different codes. And then there's classic diseases. You know, you think about diseases that we've seen over time, including things like gout, tuberculosis. And then you have modern diseases. You know, I mean, if you look at um, Mark's uh, ethics lecture series, he started back in 1982 and 85 with AIDS, and now we're at COVID, you know, so we've seen this. And then one of the other most interesting things that I have about the issue of how are syndromes and syndromes help us understand disease in a different way? And one of our colleagues, a historian named Howard Kushner, has written a very interesting article that I have on the reference list about using syndromes as a diagnostic tool. And as a, a general internist and a clinician, you can see even the etiologies and the treatments for disease have changed dramatically over time, right? One of the old adages was, um, uh, relating peptic ulcer disease to the um, high level of acid, no acid, no ulcer. And then in the recent years, Helicobacter has, you know, been identified as a cause of ulcers. And treatments have varied from milk, the milk alkali treatment, vagotomy and pyloroplasty. And when I was a medical student and a resident, this was not an unusual thing. And we saw plenty of people with gastric emptying problems that had this. When I was a resident, H2 blockers were out, and then proton pump inhibitors came, and now we have antibiotics against helicobacter. He drank the organism, made his colleagues scope him to document that he was so convinced that this was causative. And there's a whole interesting literature about self-experimentation. Um, even the same diseases over time are viewed in a different way. Chlorosis used to be a disease of, called the green disease, and used to be a disease of white women. And now it remains a major cause of micronutrient deficiencies. Iron deficiency anemia throughout the world is very common in, um, you know, in third world and low income populations. And most of the people now have iron deficiency anemia are actually not thought to be white, but thought to be um, of all different races. And then what counts as a disease and what doesn't? Here's a picture of Mary Mallon, who is typhoid Mary. And for those of you who know her story, Mary Mallon was actually a cook who was a typhoid carrier and was um, shut up in New York and quarantined for years because <clears throat> she was a transmitter of typhoid, but she was never sick. It's a fascinating story on many levels about how we understand disease, how, you know, immigration, the reach of public health, much has been written about it. And you don't have to look any further than the history of sexuality to see how, you know, um, what we understand as normal and abnormal has changed. And there's a whole literature on onanism or masturbation in the 19th century. And one of the most interesting books, a, a book written at the late 19th century, was by a German physician named Richard von Kraft Ebbing called Psychopathia Sexualis. And it's really fascinating because it's kind of the modernization of sexual diversity, focusing on immoral acts, as a, and, and his concept was a temporary deviation of norm from the innate morbid condition. And it was part of forensic medicine, which focused on things like rape and sodomy and indecency. And um, man was thrust into this irregular behavior, not as sin or crime, but as symptoms of pathology.
and it's kind of the medicalization of this. And then in the 20th century, we've seen, as people call, the discovery of homosexuality and certainly the rise of transgender as common in our world. And, you know, look no further than Caitlyn Jenner. And I think it's really important because there are generational issues. Obviously, for those of us who grew up in 19, um, I think it was 76 when he won the, um, the decathlon, you know, Bruce Jenner was a symbol of, you know, masculinity, virility, accomplishment, athleticism. And he was on the Wheaties box. So I think it has a different valence for people who live through that than younger people who really have a different view of what's normal and abnormal in sexuality. So when we use the term medicalization, we are talking about the process by which human conditions and problems come to be defined and treated as medical conditions and become the subject of medical study, diagnosis, prevention, or treatment. And all you have to do is look at the ICD-11 to see some of the codes, things that used to be part of just being alive, erectile dysfunction, wrinkles, smoking, hot flashes are now diseases and therefore in the medical domain. Demedicalization is even more interesting. Obviously, we talked about the fact that homosexuality was taken out of the, um, you know, the DSM. Jackie Duffin writes about love sickness and, you know, masturbation are clearly things that are now not thought to be pathologized. And I put the graham crackers here because in the 19th century, Sylvester Graham was part of a vegetarian movement that was very interested in um, how diet affects libido. But you don't have to look any further than the medicalized world in the fact that the same articles that are in Time magazine are also in Nature and Science. And we live in a world where people know medical terminology in a way that they didn't in our previous um, generation. And one of the things I love is this is a picture from Steve Peitzman's book. It's from the 17th century showing on the left a person who has clearly what we now uh, would think of some kind of anasarca, likely kidney um, problems or liver dis, you know, is either the person, the poor woman has either nephrotic syndrome, cirrhosis, heart failure, and it shows how she's got some areas where she probably had a paracentesis and how different that is than our modern times. I, I found this thing on the web about patient experience, you know, we're in a world where patients are now consumers. And in the past, to be a patient was a terrible thing. Now we're all part of a whole different world. So here the patient experience involves the wait time, meeting with the doctor, office and bathrooms, appointment. It's just a whole different world than the world our ancestors lived of patient experience. And then, you know, there's been a big push to look at medicine from what they call the bottom up from the patient's experience as opposed to the doctor. And, you know, we're all familiar with Frida Kahlo and her image, her self images of her uh, trauma from not only having polio, but having, a, you know, been involved in that terrible bus accident and how it affected her life. And then you've got Edvard Munch, who um, is a Norwegian um, expressionist and really captures the, the sickness. He had a lot of TB in his family and this is the sick child. Here's another one, death in the sick room. And these images are very evocative. Another book that talks about, you know, our uh, approaches to, you know, the patient experience is celebrity illness. When, you know, Baron Lerner wrote a really terrific book called When Illness Goes Public, looking at Lou Gehrig, FDR. And the reason I have FDR here is because everybody knows about FDR um, polio, but very few pictures of him in a wheelchair. It was really important not to have that showing. And Arthur Ashe, Barney Clark, the recipient of the, the first artificial heart, Betty Ford. And we live in a world with direct to consumer advertising. You know, this is advertising Zarelto. And, um, you know, there was a time when you would be kicked out of the AMA for advertising. And now we advertise dangerous drugs to patients. And then obviously physicians and other healers. And if there's anything we've learned in this lecture series, is that physicians are only one part of the healthcare team. We heard talks about nursing and osteopaths and anybody who does inpatient service knows that we are part of a bigger team, which includes medics and midwives and bone sellers. Over time, physicians are just one of many. 
And then you can look no further than the iconography, right? On the left, the image of the doctor in the 17th century holding up the matula, the urine, that was his, um, and typically it was his, his, you know, that was this significant code. Whereas in the modern times, they're, you know, wearing the white coat with the stethoscope hung around their neck. And another interesting iconography is just Thomas Aikens showing the transition from the acceptance of antisepsis from 1875 to 1889, showing the Gross and the Agnew Clinic, two hospitals in Philadelphia where he was a painter um, and was invited to, you know, paint scenes of medical uh, heroicism. And this is a picture from our special collections. Just the only reason I show it as change in practitioners is because A, these are medical students, and B, they're sitting with a skeleton, which would not be, A, the, the demographics of medical school would be different, but B, having a skeleton would not be acceptable as part of our current practice. And then, obviously, hospitals have changed over time from medieval hospitals, which were typically right next to a church and places of, you know, that were founded by religious organizations, to Rush Medical College, which is the precursor to the University of Chicago Medical School, to our very own University of Chicago Medicine, and just, you know, the hospital um, architecture and the changes are dramatic. And then how the same images can be weaponized. And this is a, um, this is a critique of the famous Luke Fielders painting, Voluntary Health Insurance, The American Way, Keep Politics Out of This Picture. Well, politics is certainly in the picture. And then the social contract. This is President um, uh, Johnson signing, you know, the Medicare and Medicaid amendments to the Social Security Act. In, 1965. And it's important to remember that the mean life expectancy was 70 years back then. Nobody thought Medicare was going to be the behemoth that it's grown into. And then technology. Um, we know that technology is part of broader systems and um, there is unanticipated costs and consequences of technology. Innovation isn't always progress. And what happens in other fields bleeds into medicine. Just think about the role of um, something like photography, um, microscopy, the role of the automobile, the ambulance, computers, and I'm not even mentioning x-rays, ultrasound, CT, MRI, and the whole diagnostics. This is a picture of Walter Freeman, one of the fathers of um, the early, um, you know, prefrontal lobotomy which at one time was thought to be a big advance in medicine. And now we obviously look at mental health and those treatments in a very different way. And then bodies, you know, this is Amelia Bloomer, a rebel in pants. You show the 19th century, how scandalous that was. And it's not a long arc from the way we think about bodies now. And obviously we're in another time period where we're reconsidering you know, bodies of different, you know, ethnic groups and when they all matter and how we should think about them. And there's nothing more um, interesting from a historical point of view than going on a field trip. And I encourage any of you, if you haven't done this, go down and see Lincoln's home in Springfield, Illinois. It's only three hours from Chicago. And you can see I did this 12 years ago. But the great thing about going and visiting these historic places are you get to be really surprised. And one of the things that really struck me when I went, this is Lincoln's bedroom. And apparently the wallpaper is a pretty good reproduction of what they, what they had. And I was just blown away by how vivid the purples were in the Lincoln bedroom. I know it seems mundane, but I just was surprised that the colors were so rich back then. But the other thing that really struck my fancy was this was the back area. This was Lincoln's outhouse. And what it reminded me of the fact that you know, cultural norms and what we think and, you know, what's, you know, private and what's public is really different. Like in the 19th century, strangers slept in the same bed. Clearly, you know, people's experience of sanitation was very different than ours. And here's a picture given to me by a friend of mine named Shauna Devine, who's a historian of the Civil War. And what you see in this picture is that this is a picture from the Army medical officers dated in 1864. 
and only two of the people are actually looking at the camera. This is very common if you see um, photography from the like late 19th and early 20th century. They're not necessarily looking forward. It's just a different convention, but it shows how these subtle things really um, embody the kind of changes that we see. And obviously this is part of an ethics conference, so this is a picture taken from the Tuskegee study, which, you know, we've talked about things like eugenics, Nazi medicine, human experimentation. We didn't have a lot on torture, but we certainly dealt with compromised leaders. And as Arthur Conan Doyle, the famous um, Scottish physician, wrote, when a doctor goes wrong, he is the first of criminals. He has nerve and all the knowledge. But as we're um, rounding out the year, I just wanted to remind people that this has been a, a really incredible lecture series, and this is the final copy of it. But basically, when I put this together, I broke it down into, you know, thinking about history in four big categories. First, there was a general talk by Bob Richards on the past is not what you think. Then there's one I call history over time. You know, Lydia's The Lost Art of Dying, Jackie Duffins How to Diagnose a Miracle, um, Walt Shalick talked about practice in medieval medicine. There was a lot on clinical historical connections, including the history of nursing and, you know, osteopathy and um, the yearly physical exam, and then clinical historical connections. And then the last is bioethical issues and bioethical lapses, and these are the talks about pain, fallen heroes, Tuskegee, the 25th Amendment, radiation studies. Mark gave a great talk on the history of clinical medical ethics, rest, wrestling with eugenics. Um, Laney gave a talk on living organ donor transplant, the shadow of slavery. Um, Sidney Halpern talked about the human experiments with hepatitis. And then last week we had Matt um, Winnie talk about how healers became not uh, killers. And what I want to do now is transition this to my friend and colleague, Steve Server. And those of you who know me know I'm a clinician who's a historian enthusiast. But I wanted to have you hear from somebody who actually practices research and writes history. Steve is an MD, PhD candidate who will receive his PhD in a few weeks and then return to the fourth year at the Pritzker School of Medicine. He's a close colleague, an invaluable friend, and a kindred spirit in this process. And I really wanted him to talk about the skills and approach that historians use and how historians can make meaning of things. So we're going to swap seats and I'm going to let uh, Steve take it over. Okay. That looks good. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Dr. Schwartz, and thank you all for being here. And <clears throat> it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to talk to you all about sort of <clears throat> the life I've lived for the last seven years, um, sort of traversing back and forth across Ellis Avenue between kind of the medical side of the university and the academic side of the university. And sort of to, to Dr. Schwartz's general point, you know, I hope to talk a little bit about sort of the ways in which historians, academic historians, make meaning of things um, in such a way as to, you know, potentially encourage clinicians um, to reflect upon the way that they make meaning of things. And perhaps there's uh, some lessons that can be uh, had uh, from sort of looking uh, over the fence at the other, at, at the way that others make knowledge. So, uh, you know, a great way to start that, and, you know, as an MD, PhD historian, I stand on the shoulders of giants, um, you know, one of whom is, is Jackie Duffin, who's on the call. This is from this book, this article right here. Margaret Humphreys is another MD, PhD historian. Um, so Clio and the Clinic uh, is essentially an attempt to sort of understand the role that history could play in medical practice. And in this article called Beware the Poor Historian, Margaret Humphreys essentially uh, sort of starts as, as a framing piece, this idea about uh, clinicians deeming uh, sort of their patients poor historians. Uh, and the deeper question is, okay, well, you know, as an MD, PhD historian herself, uh, Margaret Humphreys is eager to sort of problematize and think a little bit about you know, what it really might mean to be a, a poor historian uh, from the patient perspective, but really, you know, focus more uh, pointedly on what it means uh, to be a poor historian from the MD's perspective. And so, you know, I think a way to sort of think about that is, 
uh, the ways in which there are different registers at which historians make meaning of things, uh, just as there are different way registers at which clinicians make meaning of things. And sort of to blow that up and explore that in detail, I think we can use um, an article that uh, was in Tuskegee's Truths, which was in the edited volume by Susan Reverby. This is an article called Racism and Research by Alan Brandt, who's a PhD historian. Uh, and, you know, I think it's a useful kind of framing device to really, as I said, probe the different ways in which or the different um, levels at which historians make meaning of things. And this is, I think, a sort of historical episode that all of us um, sort of have a general understanding of. So the first level uh, sort of, of making meaning that historians engage with is sort of the question of well, what actually happened, um, because sort of from a, I think, conceptual and philosophical perspective, how, how can we really have any further conversations if we don't really agree on the basic contours of a shared reality? Um, you know, anecdotally, maybe that's part of the sort of straits that we're in in American society at the moment. Um, and so, you know, in Alan Brandt's uh, chapter in that, in that edited volume, uh, for example, he went to the archives, which, you know, the National Archives had uh, sources that sort of dealt with uh, sort of the many years of the Tuskegee experiments and found something that the Health, Education, and Welfare Report of 1973 really didn't focus on, uh, which was the fact that uh, MDs talking to sort of the patients that they interacted in Tuskegee argued that the spinal taps that they would be providing uh, would be therapeutic as opposed to uh, sort of diagnostic, you know, of, of neurosyphilis, right? So essentially in missing that key detail that the spinal taps were always articulated as therapeutic for patients, Essentially, he discovered a matter of fact that totally alters the health education and welfare report, you know, report casting uh, of the Tuskegee uh, sort of experience and really emphasizes the level of the ethical violation in a way that the initial report that was undertaken by the federal government simply did not capture by sort of a neglect of the primary source base, right? And, you know, uh, you know I think clinicians are quite comfortable at this register of making meaning, right? We live in a world of uh, uh, interpreting and analyzing various sorts of data, both on their face, uh, but also sort of the, the meta level of, you know, what are the limitations of this form of data, the limitations of this test versus another test, uh, the use of complementarity in terms of testing, right? Like, uh, what does this sort of source tell us that uh, another source might not, and reading them together, we get a better sort of overall uh, understanding of the scenario on the ground. Um, and, you know, I think in general, historians do a similar thing. Um, now, historians use different sorts of primary sources than physicians do. Um, obviously, they make recourse extensively to archives to publish sources. Um, these days, more sort of big data sets and quantitative uh, data. Um, but they've also, you know, used archaeological sources, uh, molecular data from ancient sources. And uh, our friends on the other side of university uh, at the OI, uh, decided to make use of some of our medical technology to uh, ascertain some interesting facts about uh, historical figures, namely these mummies. And you can see, if you're able at the top right of this CT, the patient is mummy. Um, and we can see this sort of finding in the lower left CT scan, this sort of defect here, would be the area where embalmers who are mummifying the body remove the brain. Um, and so essentially, you know, that's a creative use of um, sort of sources that um, are not commonly used by historians, but there may be a potential for creative synergy if we think broadly and creatively about such things. The next level that I think is useful to think about is sort of interpretive issues, right? And it's sort of one thing to say, oh yes, you know, these, these are the matters of fact, but uh, the context surrounding those matters of fact actually makes a, a great deal of difference in terms of our overall interpretation of the flow of events in time, right? Um, you know, in other words, in our search for multi-causal explanations for things within history and within medicine, uh, we need to take, uh, you know, a very close eye on sort of the context within which our, our primary sources are elucidated, right? Um, now, within history, um, you know, we think very pointedly about sort of the theoretical commitments of the analyst of those primary sources, right? So in addition to the fact that primary sources may tell different stories depending on where they come from. The actual analyst, you know, his or herself is part of this process by which we have to sort of, um, you know, parse what context they may be living in. Um, and so, you know, that I put pictures up on the, on the top here. We have Karl Marx and Michel Foucault who are sort of 
uh, have been touchstones for sort of generations of historians thinking about uh, analyzing primary sources in one way or another. Uh, and so again, to return to this Alan Brandt article, the question is, who is he writing in reference to or in relation to regarding Tuskegee? And what are kind of the key thematic and conceptual issues that he chooses to engage with at his moment of writing? And you know, as I mentioned before, it's this Health Education and Welfare Report of 1973, um, you know, which I think is interesting. In that, in that report, Brandt basically identifies this quote, which is that the, health, the sort of authors of the report argued that sort of the experience of Tuskegee should not be construed to be a general repudiation of the scientific research with human subjects. And so essentially he argued that because of the un underlying agenda of the Health Education and Welfare Department to ensure that sort of uh, scientific research with human subjects could proceed apace, uh, they didn't do the, their due diligence in the archives and really ascertain um, sort of the matters of fact to, to a satisfactory degree, right? Um, so that, that's at one level. And at the other, he basically argues that, you know, sort of circulating at the time was this idea, well, and sort of it still persists, is the idea that science is somehow free of values is a truly objective way of knowing the world. And Brandt, uh, you know, I think effectively uses primary sources um, to demonstrate that in point of fact, the physicians who participated in the Tuskegee experiments uh, were fundamentally uh, immersed within a, uh, you know, a medicalized uh, racist sort of society. Um, and so the idea that they were doing science that was free of values is, you know, simply proven to be inaccurate. Um, and so, you know, again, I think clinicians do do this work all the time. Uh, I think it's often implicit, um, but they don't necessarily directly engage with some of the issues of positionality, of agenda, of commitment that I think historians sort of do in an automatic way. And, and his, for historians, this is done sort of automatically because we have a big commitment to understanding kind of historiography. Now, I don't want to scare clinicians. It's, you know, word, some words have the potential to turn people off right away. But I, I think if we do sort of a thought exercise together, we might capture a little bit of sort of what I mean by historiography. And broadly, it's sort of, I think, can be interpreted as our way of thinking about sources, um, and the ways in which that can be informed by our environments as, as the analyst, our context, our various agendas, theories, commitments, etc. So, you know, this is a little bit of a speculative exercise, but I think it's, it, it can capture in a practical way what kind of a historiographical engagement might be. So all of us, I think, are familiar with the 1918 flu pandemic. And as perhaps you can appreciate, it, at different periods in time, we might have written about the 1918 flu pandemic in different ways. So in 1967, for example, we might have sort of taken a Marxist or materialist perspective within, you know, which was common within histories at the time, which might meant that we, we, which might have meant that we focused on the perspective of workers, of farmers, of those considered traditionally sort of proletarians. Um, given that 1967, um, you know, we were in the United States experiencing sort of a war in Vietnam, and the flu pandemic in 1918 was sort of at the tail end of World War I, maybe we would have seen echoes of sort of the dislocations caused by war um, and read them back into the 1918 planned pandemic. In 1987, things obviously were different than they were in 1967. And so maybe historians, uh, you know, might have looked to the uh, AIDS epidemic as sort of an example uh, to sort of frame their studies of the flu pandemic of 1918. Uh, within history, it was more common in the, you know, the 80s to focus on the role of the state per se in offering sort of, you know, in structuring our day-to-day -day realities. And so maybe they would focus on sort of the, Will, you know, the Wilson administration's approach to the flu pandemic in ways that might, they might not have done in the 60s. Now in 2019, uh, which is, you know, should be more familiar to all of us, you know, within history, it was, uh, I think it has been a trend to, you know, sort of problematize the idea of the state being the real author of sort of day-to-day -day life and focusing more on kind of the interstices between the state and local actors and how that ultimately gives rise to a form of living, right? Um, like, as I said before, big data in 2019 has sort of been more influential in history as a, as, a, as a discipline. And as you can appreciate, in 2019, sort of right before the pandemic happened, we might tell a different story about the, the flu pandemic than we would in 2022 after we have just lived through a viral pandemic, right? Would, would in 2022, would we write a history of the 1918 flu pandemic that calls it the Spanish flu? I think perhaps not because of what we've observed about sort of the weaponization of sort of anti-Asian bias um, within our contemporary moment. Would we be so credulous about the role of the state to respond to sort of public health concerns? 
um, would, be, would, would we be so credulous about sort of a shared public uh, sort of conception of a fight against uh, sort of a, a major challenge to health of, a, of American society, for example? Again, I'm not so sure. But, but I hope sort of by this kind of thought experiment, you can appreciate the fact that the ways in which we understand history uh, are kind of inextricable from the way that we as analysts live through history. Um, and sort of we can't divorce the fact that we are historical beings as we think about people in the past, which I think is a lesson uh, that is important for clinicians. Um, you know, we all have uh, theoretical commitments and the key is identifying what those might be. Um, and so, you know, to that point, I think the, the last level that I really want to talk about in terms of um, levels of making meaning is that, you know, history has the potential to make, to, to have a practical purpose, right? Um, you know, histories in a practical sense bring groups together. There's a sociological function to the telling of stories. Um, they allow us to articulate shared values, shared experiences, um, and in so doing sort of coalesce a group of people around these kind of mythologizing um, tales. Now, I think historically, doctors have been very adept at this. Um, you know, in an article by Brian, Brian and Longo, which is on a bibliography, uh, they describe this as sort of a nostalgic professionalism that sort of medicine, that physicians have often deployed, um, which fosters a sense of belonging, solidarity, and identity. And, you know, arguably you could say some of the key geographic histories written in the 19th century, which is to say sort of histories that are celebrating the great heroes of the march of medical progress, uh, are, are of this genre, if you will, that they, they make meaning in this way, which is that look to our great heroes and we can take heart that we're part of a, a noble profession, right? Um, and in that regard, sort of the, the kind of uh, nostalgic professionalist uh, approach to history allows us to, you know, cultivate uh, useful role, role models. And in so doing, we can sort of imagine a sort of virtue ethics uh, developing out of these kind of um, nostalgic histories. But I think what's really important for clinicians as they move forward is that we pay very close attention to the mythologies that we craft, right? Uh, certainly it's important to, you know, uh, recognize our shared values as physicians over time and across place. Uh, but, you know, to bring up um, Baron Lerner's work uh, of earlier in this, in this series, um, sometimes our fallen heroes maybe, you know, should stay fallen. Um, and it, so I think we can be very purposeful about the kind of mythologies we craft because uh, our current moment changes and medicine as a profession changes and we need to be very purposeful about the kind of set of shared values and experiences that we mean to create for our next generations. Um, and I think the other sort of to that end, um, I think sort of and in keeping with the theme of this talk, explaining the past in a, more, in a richer, more comprehensive, multi-causal way allows us not only to understand our present moment, but also allows us to make plans to improve the future. And, and you know, I think, sort of within social sciences work and, and among MD PhDs who do social sciences work. Uh, this has sort of been operationalized as focusing on structural competency as opposed to some, you know, an older paradigm of cultural competence, competency among the training of physicians. Um, and really that's about identifying the deep uh, structural causes, be they racial, be they economic, be they political, be they social, uh, that undergird kind of the healthcare disparities that we, that unfortunately we experience and, and that persist um, and that really do um, do a great deal to sort of damage not only individual doctor-patient relationships, but also the aggregate health uh, of sort of uh, our patient body. And so, you know, I think the, the goal of doing this kind of practical work, which, you know, Brian Longo maybe referred to as activistic professionalism or activist professionalism, is not simply condemning historical actors, right? Like, surely, uh, you know, there have been ethical violations in the past. Um, and certainly Alan Brandt identifies the ethical violations that were implicit in the Tuskegee experience, right? Uh, but it's not enough to simply say we condemn that. It's uh, the, the key critical component of making meaning at this practical level is to explain why and how the Tuskegee experiments could have happened and could have persisted for, you know, whatever it is, 40 years, uh, that will really allow us to identify the deeper structures implicit within medicine um, that uh, we really need to pay, pay a close eye to if we make plans, if, if we are to make plans to improve things uh, for, for our patients, right? It's, you know, to that end, I think history and social sciences generally are useful in cultivating, um, you know, what we can think of as both kind of epistemic and clinical humility. And so I think it's really useful for clinicians to ask themselves these questions. So, you know, even the most celebrated historical figures had, had blind spots and, and uh, committed, you know, uh, 
uh, acts that we would deem ethical violations uh, of various sorts. So, uh, you know, I think what's useful about the social sciences is it demands that we as analysts examine our very own blind spots um, and force us to work to find mechanisms by which we can probe them and interrogate our own, our own um, sort of blind spots. Um, and I think the other sort of benefit of doing social sciences work uh, on a regular basis is the fact that some of the things that we do every single day, we don't really pay a great deal of attention to. And uh, thinking as a social scientist, thinking as a, you know, in terms of structural competency, allows us to uh, put those under the microscope and say, perhaps there are things that I do every single day that might actually be contributing to some of these structural inequities. Um, and maybe I can change my daily practice so, so that I may not be led astray as it happened in the historical past, right? And, you know, I think there are several, you know, sort of great examples in recent, very recent times of, of the ways in which history can be really used for good advocacy work to improve medicine. I think this series is really a great example of demonstrating uh, and identifying in a rich, comprehensive way the various structures within medicine, within which medicine has taken form. Um, you know, it has expanded our understanding of uh, sort of medicalized racism, of uh, medicalized misogyny, uh, of, ine of various inequities on political dimensions, on social dimensions. And so that kind of work, I think, really does advance the ball in terms of making uh, medicine a more responsive, um, you know, sort of uh, just endeavor. Uh, a few weeks ago at, at Johns Hopkins, they had this symposium in the history of medicine, specifically focusing on closing this open wound. And you can see there, uh, design there, a really rec reckoning with the role that academic medicine has played, um, n not only uh, actively uh, sort of supporting uh, scientific racism by its sort of scientific pretensions, right, but also by participating in processes of, of racial inequity and racial violence, right, and really doing structural violence. And so, you know, put, putting a name to that and allowing for speakers to speak very openly about the participation of medicine in some of these sort of um, structurally violent projects of colonialism, slavery, etc., again, is, is a great way of doing historical work as advocacy. And finally, you know, this is an article that was uh, in JAMA several years ago. Uh, really sort of at the behest of the AMA seeking to uh, redress some of the racial injustices of its own sort of organizational past, asked a group of scholars uh, and physicians, uh, Matthew Winnie was one of them, uh, to explore the role played by the AMA in essentially creating a seg segregated racialized medicine in the United States at the end of, the, you know, from the 19th century into the 20th century. And so all of these, I think, are great examples of, of what clinicians and historians can do sort of in lockstep to uh, work to create a better structure for all of us to practice in and a better, more just structure for our patients to receive uh, care in. Um, and, you know, certainly it's useful for already MDs to uh, think about structural issues. But I think, you know, perhaps more pointedly and more effectively, we can think about what we can do for medical students to really become immersed uh, and make a habit of thinking about things in structural manners, right, in, in a structural manner. Um, so, you know, within the medical education literature of re in recent times, there's been this focus on physician burnout. Um, and to some degree, we can sort of understand burnout as a, a, a sort of syndrome, if you will, or um, caused by kind of the moral distress and alienation caused by navigating kind of dehumanizing structural inequities uh, inherent in, in modern medicine, whether they be sort of the issues of having to deal with insurance companies or sort of the dehumanization of certain sorts of people that sometimes just happens in, in an implicit way in medicine based on our structures, that, that, that can certainly burn physicians out. And within the medical education literature, they basically argue that cultivating empathy, sort of in, in quotes because it's, it's not always clear exactly how we might do that or what it might mean, but it's viewed that empathy is a primary prevention for the at-risk, namely medical trainees and medical practitioners. And so the question for all of us is, well, how do we teach empathy? And, uh, you know, again, let's look to history. You know, Virchow, Rudolf Virchow, sort of the father of social medicine in the mid-19th century, argued that, well, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing other than medicine at a larger scale. And so I think, you know, perhaps what empathy might mean in an operational way in medical education is really focusing uh, on the social sciences, uh, focus, you know, working to provide students with all of the intellectual tools, certainly uh, a rigorous training in the hard sciences, uh, but also sort of the important humanistic and social scientific tools that might allow them to better understand their patients and themselves as kind of richly contextual social beings as opposed to these kind of dehumanized um, operators in a structurally in an, an unequal system. Um, and then the question becomes, well, then how do we teach that?
and you know i I think unfortunately in recent years what has happened is um we've kind of made recourse to all of those things that we think are important uh in the basic sciences right sort of reductionism standardization centralization uh recourse to sort of multiple choice tests uh, to an evidence-based curriculum and sort of a uh, commitment to a scientific tidiness of the social sciences. And, you know, I, I think, you know, using this Albert Einstein quote is maybe sort of illustrative of how I think about that, which is that everything that can be counted doesn't necessarily count and that everything that counts can't necessarily be counted. And so, you know, arguably there is, uh, it's sort of maybe the wrong tool for the job to assess the impact that certain uh, sort of humanistic and social scientific interventions in medical school curricula um, might contribute to the benefit from an educational perspective of medical students. Um, you know, I think uh, Jeremy, uh, sorry, Jeremy Green and David Jones, both MD, PhD historians, had an article in Academic Medicine in 2017. And obviously the, what, you know, Dr. Schwartz referred to as the white paper that uh, Jones and Green and Jackie Duffin and John Harley Warner all contributed to is essentially this idea that, you know, it seems that the medical humanities are held maybe to a different standard, a different evidentiary standard uh, to prove their ultimate benefit to medical students than anatomy has been. Um, you know, Jones and Green basically argued that at a lot of institutions, you know, within the last 10 years, they just sort of dropped their anatomy curricula without sort of an evidence base showing that it was kosher for them to do that. Similar thing with adding genetics to curricula. Um, and, you know, essentially they argue that, well, you know, maybe that says something about sort of our underlying biases about the appropriateness of including social sciences, uh, in including history within our curricula. And so instead, maybe we can think in a different way about sort of the importance of history in the training of medical students um, by instead of, you know, searching for a scientific tidiness with which we can sort of describe the human experience and identify big social structures that cause inequities. Maybe we need to sort of dig deep into what is maybe in a pejorative way called to as human messiness. Uh, but, you know, what historians live with every day, which is an embrace of multi-causality, a diversity of sources, a method, a theory, an appreciation of change over time, uh, a spirit of kind of self-exploration and um, a commitment to um, sort of a rigorous subjectivity and uh, sort of a, a habit of holding deeply held ideas up to close scrutiny, both by oneself and by one's peers. Um, you know, and I think if we're able to do that, um, we will be sort of, um, we can take shelter against some of the real challenges caused by living in a inherently turbulent, challenging, sometimes structurally violent world, um, and particularly a challenging, turbulent, ever-changing uh, profession of medicine. And so just to return to Margaret Humphrey's piece that was in Clio in the clinic, you know, she basically argues that as an MD, PhD historian herself, uh, living through sort of residency um, during the height of the AIDS uh, epidemic, um, she had to sort of take heart that history would allow her to understand sort of the wild sort of changes around her. Um, and you can see at the bottom of this quote here, uh, you know, her historical training allowed her to understand sort of what she was living through from the perspective of memory, right, understanding the history of medicine, but also allowing her to understand the structures that would best permit her to evolve to be a better practitioner for her patients. So again, to return to this concept that I started with about sort of uh, doctors frequently griping about patients as being historians, you know, I think it's useful to say that good historians make good patients, but they really do make even better doctors. Um, and so I thank you for your attention, and I really want to turn things back over to uh, Dr. Schwartz, my, my great friend and mentor. So thank you. Okay, friends, we're in the home stretch. We're just going to do um, one other quick thing. That was terrific, Steve. So I just want to put on the side here our, um, I just wanted to have our email addresses for anybody who is interested in continuing this conversation. But what I wanted to do is also use this few minutes to thank people. First, I want to thank Mark um, Siegler, who allowed me to kind of co-op this lecture series and kind of gave me carte blanche. You can tell that I um, uh, picked like a group of colleagues, friends, and people I knew would be just terrific and very engaging for this group. The other thing is Mark's got an incredibly talented staff, starting with Elena Stankaitis, Ronana Dine, um, Kimberly Connor, and Glennis Harris. And the difference between having a lecture series that's good and a lecture series that's terrific is really a function of the attention to details. And um, Elena, you can do anything. You are um, incredible. 
I want to thank Steve, who obviously uh, you can see why he's my colleague and kindred spirit, and he has tremendous potential that we're all going to support. And then I want to thank the speaker, uh, the speakers, including um, all 28 speakers who gave talks, and especially to Lainey Ross and Sydney Halpern, who pinched hit at the last minute when we needed substitutions and did a superb job. I want to thank Deb Warner for her contributions for the library and being in the chat and always um, referencing the U of C resources. I also want to thank the community, especially the McLean Ethics Series, Bucksbaum, the university community, and our friends from the American Association for the History of Medicine, and just our many um, friends and kindred spirits worldwide. Juliana Khalil was the intern who did marketing. And but before we leave and before we start the uh, question and answer period, I want to just um, highlight one last thing about an upcoming exhibit that uh, was put together by Brian Callender, and Steve's going to talk about that, and then we'll open it up for questions. Great. So, you know, I talked a little bit about kind of the, the ways in which uh, that kind of academic work and clinical work can be, uh, you know, real allies in terms of advocacy work. And I think, you know, Dr. Callender's exhibit here at the REG, which is running now through July 15th called Reframing Graphic Medicine, is a great example of that. And I was very sort of uh, very uh, happy to be able to help him with it. Um, and, you know, I think really the exhibit uh, focusing specifically on this question of history from below, right? challenging the traditional sources that we have used to understand some kind of the growth of medicine as a profession, um, I think really allows us to see the ways in which, again, sort of these different structures have led to patient experiences um, that, you know, maybe, maybe doctors are not very familiar with. So, uh, you know, ac across comics, across zines, across graphic novels, uh, we are allowed insight into sort of patient experiences and dimensions of, you know, uh, reproductive health, mental health, um, infectious diseases, um, you know, sort of issues of gender and sexuality uh, in ways that I think just can't fully be captured by um, sort of a, a cold, objective, austere uh, clinical report that many of us, you know, within history uh, use to support our histories, but also that uh, many clinicians sort of understand our patients by means of. So highly recommend a, a, a look and, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity, all of us, to get together there and, and chat. Um, and celebrate uh, you know, Dr. Callender's accomplishment with this great exhibit at the REG. So with that, I think we're ready to open it up open for it questions. Up. Yeah. OK, you guys, um, we should take a look at the chat. <laughs> um, That's great. So let's see what we got here. Um, oh, sure. so there's actually a lot of really great um, references. Um, Deb Burnett said. I, <laughs> Deb Burnett said she was at, on call at the hospital when um, they did that <laughs> that CT at the mummy. Hey Jay, you want to um, take over and? Uh, Should we stop the share? We can do that. Yeah, okay. we can do that. Oh great. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is a, an excellent excellent talk. Um, so I, I'm a, uh, as I, I always disclaim, I'm a philosopher, uh, not a not a physician or or a historian. Um, and so I have a couple of, you know, I'm not sure how to. I'm always sort of puzzled by the sort of the philosophy of history in the it's following sort of sense that, I mean, on the one hand, we think that you know part of the part of the importance of history is is getting us to you know we want to know sort of what happened. We want to get to it is important to distinguish the sort of the the facts of the facts of what actually occurred from you know from from misinformation from you know from uh, uh, alternate from alternate histories that didn't actually occur, um, and so that so so that's effectively sort of like a realist sort of picture of like what what history is supposed to do you know in the same sort of model of like that's what science is supposed to do it's supposed to get us to like real describe you know reality in itself. On the other hand, you know, part of what's sort of interesting about, you know, the history of science, history of medicine, um, is, you know, this sort of, you know, everyone has thought up to this point that we've gotten, sort of, that we're getting, oh, this is what, this is what really happened. This is what, this is what's really going on in this, in this patient or these patients. And yet, time and time again, we have this sort of like, uh, we sort of show, it's been, you know, it's been sort of demonstrated, those sort of those claims have been sort of have been shown to be sort of inadequate. 
maybe even wrong-headed, maybe even pernicious in various different ways. And I think in the case of history, that's really sort of interesting. I loved your presentation of the, the 1918 uh, pandemic, where you know there's different sort of different sort of uh, valences that we that we can take to this to this event um, based on you know our own current situation. And I think you might, but you might be you might be sort of inclined to think, well, you know, okay, well, so the you know there's the Marxist way of understanding this. There's the you know, the, there's a sort of more status approach. There's a sort of anti-status approach. And you might think, well, who's, you know, who's, what is the sort of right approach? My understanding of like a lot of historians is that kind of, it's kind of like, in a sense, a kind of a, uh, like an ill-formed question because we don't have that sort of like view from nowhere. Um, but that sort of just leaves us in this, you know, this kind of like history is this kind of like Rashomon effect where, um, and so I, I'm, I'm curious if you have some thoughts on like how, I mean, obviously it's sort of the humility aspect of this is gonna play a big role here, but I'm curious if you have any sort of thoughts on that, on this sort of, this sort of really troublesome uh, uh, issue, at least troublesome for me. Yeah. So thanks. Did you wanna talk? Okay. Yeah, no, I, I'm happy to talk about that. And, you know, I don't wanna get, I don't wanna get too deep into sort of hard philosophy of history stuff. But, you know, I, I think it is, I think you bring up a great point that's been sort of an epistemic anxiety within history, you know, really for a lot of the 20th century. Um, you know, a lot of the work of kind of logical positivists, logical empiricists in the mid 20th century, you know, which was this group of, of philosophers aiming to create sort of a philosophy of science that generated true knowledge based on laws of logic. Sort of it's a, you know, in some respects, a kind of utopian project, but in any event, you know, the idea was, well, what we should do with the social sciences is reform them in such a way such that the, uh, such that sort of historical knowledge is able to have as stable kind of ground as what we perceive the natural sciences to be. And that means that historians need to start adopting sort of a principle of using natural laws that can explain human, human behavior and causality. Um, and as perhaps you can appreciate, historians were al rather allergic to that idea. Um, Bob Richards, who gave a talk earlier this quarter, uh, or I think it was winter maybe, um, you know, has a great sort of riposte to uh, Carl Hempel's talk on sort of this, what's called the kind of nomological or, or scientistic based history, which is essentially the idea that, well, in point of fact, uh, you know, even by sort of the natural law approach, and he uses this interesting example of a car radiator that's uh, that cracks in the middle of the night in a cold Chicago winter. And basically the sort of scientific historian would say, oh, well, simply because the water froze at 32 degrees meant that the radiator cracked, right? And we can appreciate that that is an explanation, uh, but it might not be an adequate explanation when we learn that, you know, the guy grounded his son that night uh, and put a, so the son acting out, put a cherry bomb in his radiator and blew up the radiator. And so, you know, by that logic, essentially, we're missing something by only making recourse to natural laws. And instead, what we need to do is sort of eschew that and say, let's really embrace narrativity as a fundamental way of making knowledge. And so, you know, I, I think, as you pointed out, there are some tensions uh, that are still sort of uh, potentially exploitable by those who are eager to kind of critique inherent subjectivity within history. But I think day-to-day -day practice, um, most of the time historians are somewhat pragmatic about this idea that like yeah there's kind of a there's something that really happened but uh, sort of it's sort of like uh the you know the anecdote of three people blindfolded people touching an elephant that sort of there is some underlying phenomenon and you know even though one person's touching the tusk one person's touching the the skin and one person is touching the tail um and are all sort of describing different facets of that underlying reality that you know different perspectives sort of have different meanings. And so maybe I don't want to, again, talk too much about philosophy, but maybe that's my kind of back of the envelope way of thinking about it. I hope that was kind of helpful. Thanks. Anybody else interested in either making a comment or adding to the mix? Dr. Heckmott, you want to say something? Unmute yourself. There you go. One second, Doc. I have an observation that I wonder if you agree with it. Um, the digital technology has improved a great deal diagnosis, but you referred earlier that uh, 
history taking and examination duration has diminished. And it seems to me that taking history uh, of the patient is not only clarifying some of the hidden part of the patient's illness, but it develops doctor-patient relationship in a hidden way. While you are talking to the patient, take the history, your children, how have you been in the past? What is your history? All these things develop an amicable relation with the patient. So not infrequently, particularly in surgery, a patient comes with an MRI scan, so it maybe shows a brain tumor. And the uh, patient come and say, you know, you have a brain tumor. How come you come for additional consultation? He said, well, the doctor looked at my MRI and it just wanted to schedule me. And I, I really didn't know the doctor. And so, because patient comes for consultation because they really don't want to have an operation. And all of a sudden somebody say, you need an operation without developing it. Or another patient comes say, you know, you had this back pain and, then, and you look like you need an operation. What made you not have it? He said, this doctor even touched my back. Now touching the back may not necessarily make the diagnosis, but develop that relationship, doctor relationship that is needed. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, I think that somewhere down the road, I hope we live to the point that we can see it is the fact that, that uh, the doctor patient, the doctor nurse relationship is really sacrosanct to trust and really effective healthcare. And I think that it's the critique people have of modern medicine, you know, outcomes may be objectively good, bad, or indifferent, but the patient's experience has been, you know, problematic. And, you know, just like you see these images, you know, since we've had the electronic medical record of, you know, you know, children have drawn like the doctor patient experience and they have a picture of a doctor sitting by a computer typing with his back to the patient. It's uh, I think, you know, if anything history teaches us is that things change and it is my great hope that over time we're going to slow down this um, assembly line view of medicine because it doesn't serve doctors, it doesn't serve patients. And I think at the end of the day, it's more expensive because we go too fast, we make mistakes and we don't make, we don't do exactly what you have. Like a perfect example, Dr. Heckmott is you know, years ago, somebody had a surgery by a doctor and they would go, you know, they would go see that doctor afterwards. In our hyper um, efficient, you know, organization, you know, that doctor may come in while they're getting pre opt they're followed by an APN, a resident or something like that. And it really um, dissolves the trust and the healthcare team if they're not even uh, portrayed as a, a inner unit, you know, it's just like a rotating circus. Like, who are you and what are you doing here? And you're supposed to help me. And how do I know that you're not the cleaning lady versus, you know, the, um, the advanced practice nurse. So I think that my hope is over time that that becomes one of the things that we can observe change. And we've, we've experienced it, as Steve would say, on a very human and interpersonal level, both on, both ends of it as patients and as care providers. Thank you. Anyway. So listen, but thank you everybody for participating in this. Anybody who's interested, um, I'm just gonna make a blatant shout out. If anybody's really interested, the American Association for the History of Medicine has all kinds of wonderful resources and terrific scholars. And my hope is that we continue to um, incorporate history into medical education on every level, doctors, nurses, patients, the whole healthcare team, including all of our colleagues from occupational therapists, physical therapists, boy, we've never been more of a team than before. And I think that there's a role for us, both interprofessional learning and just in terms of human contact and creating a palpable sense of community, because if anything that the good part of COVID is that we felt like we're part of something bigger. And when we've shown up in the best way, 
you know, it's been nice for people to go beyond themselves and help when they're needed. So what I'm going to do is let everybody take a little deep breath. I'm going to meet with the ethics fellow later. I want to thank Steve. I want to thank everybody for coming. And thanks to the um, McLean Center for allowing us to have a year, which I thought was terrific. And thanks, everybody, both the community and the speakers. And we'll see you down next uh, in, a, in a half hour to those. And if not, later on, we've got all the resources that people want. So thanks. Hold on just for one second. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you um, and, and Stephen about you, your talk today, but, but also congratulate you for the extraordinary program that you organized for the year. I mean, this, this series of 28 lectures, um, many of them drawn from the American Association of the History of Medicine, um, from you, your, your friends and colleagues. Um, I think this year's seminars uh, with clinicians, historians, and other scholars were simply incredible and outstanding.